so today I uh, uh, talk on about uh, right livelihood, something like that, how to um, be live, how to do our life. So sometimes that has, you know, very detailed issues. Um, for four months, been out of my house, <laughs> when flooded and uh, back in the house. So that helps a little bit. But then there's hours and hours of um, negotiating with insurance companies, contractors. So I, I've missed out on one of my livelihoods. So uh, I'm going to crack that right now. So th things don't go well when I don't have coffee with Mike Heffel every once in a while. So are you available Monday morning between 10 and noon? It's on. Okay. So I'm putting it in. <laughs> I know. I was like, I've been out of it. So that's good. Yeah. Um, we have to take care of these things, you know. So, Trunk Rimshi's words come back to me a lot these days. Um, and the, I hear him say, it's all scheduling. <laughs> Didn't know what he was talking about, but now I do. Okay, good. So right livelihoods are a very important part of the Buddha's approach to yoga, the Eightfold Yoga Path, Astaga Marga. So, but it's not talked about as much, you know, by teachers, is it? Don't get, you're not going to get a formal talk from a Sergei Geshe on a right livelihood, are you? Because from monastic point of view, if you're following the monastic schedule and the Vinaya, then you're doing the right livelihood. And you're doing the Bodhisattva practice, you're doing the right livelihood. But our Sangha here particularly is made up of uh, householder uh, yogis, isn't that so? So we have to definitely talk about how we um, organize and schedule our lives how we um, support ourselves, how we take care of ourselves, how we take care of each other and take care of uh, Dharma Center. So th that's a big topic for today, big deal. Also, part of the right livelihood is um, I bought some um, of my practice uh, sacred practice objects, I call, um, to uh, help fundraise for um, improving uh, the environment, improving the cottage, so that we have uh, AC and heat that doesn't use so much energy and also works better and is um, quieter. So some people have already donated very generously, um, and I, I deeply appreciate that because um, we're, we're trying our best to have a uh, little negative impact, um, but right now I have not evolved to the high yogic state where extreme heat doesn't bother me. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we're um, always going to be fundraising because that's part of right livelihood. Essentially, right livelihood is understanding that life is an energy exchange or a gift exchange. So all of Dharma is based on interdependence. And interdependence means that things are exchanged. They're not uh, just parts. Sometimes we say that, you know, teachers sometimes give examples like even the Buddha did or different monks saying, okay, the chariot has parts. So it can't, it, there's no thing that we could find just as the chariot or the chair. But um, interdependence also means more than just parts. It means that in a particular tantric way, we're sharing and exchanging energy. And um, it happens in a certain kind of pattern. 
Well, I'm just so broad, so I, I think I'm going to leave it up to Dan at some point to describe that. But um, generally, uh, um, teachers uh, give away some things and keep some things, right? Um, when you're studying with uh, a master, it's really a blessing to uh, get or be recipient of like a Dharma gift. It's not hard talking about myself like this. You wouldn't, you wouldn't find that to blend. <laughs> you can say, it's really odd about that we only got a gift for me, but you have to say that. And then, yeah. So, because people don't know. Um, so, uh, if if that teacher has used or um, uh, personally the practice, then it it becomes sacred in our tradition. Um, uh, so, I try to use things and 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 sometimes give them away. Um, um, but here I thought we could kind of public, you know, so it'd be a little random, like, okay, so you want this, that's fine, you know, to to raise money and um, uh, support, because it's a gift exchange that keeps us going. But uh, the idea is that also, not only are you getting something that we, we have some spiritual power, um, but also the tradition is that by donating, uh, we build our positive potential. Sometimes it's called merit. It's hard to get away from that word. <laughs> I don't know what it's like, like merit badge, but um, this, is, uh, this is the case that in our tradition, the, um, when we donate something to a temple, uh, then um, this, uh, or even dedicate our practice. So we always do a dedication at the end, then it, it increases uh, our storehouse and uh, maybe psychologically we could call it like a resource state or something. You can draw from it, right? Because things get hard and you have to draw from it. So uh, uh, when Kinsler Rumshe was here um, uh, maybe a month ago, he said, oh, Lomachip has a lot of uh, merit, right, to build. So that's going back lifetimes, and then uh, it has a great store, and then uh, everybody shows up and it manifests, right? So when we say great merit, um, it's not the building is the great merit, it's the Sangha, right? But uh, we need a building for it to meet, don't you think? So we do need um, things that are beautiful and um, efficient and workable and artistic. So that's early livelihood as the exchange, the gift exchange based on interdependence. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. The Buddha didn't do a lot of things to householders um, to do and not to do, but um, probably it's pretty accurate. <laughs> he said, uh, don't sell. Um, weapons, don't uh, sell um, drugs, and um, try not to be a butcher or something like that. There's got to be more, you know, but um, uh, the other part is um, don't, don't buy and sell art. So sacred art is supposed to be a gift to the um, artist and not a price. Um, and it's supposed to be a gift exchange. So back in the day uh, when I was living in Nevada City, I had a, a, a store called Three Jewels Asian Arts. And a friend of mine, John Travis, who's a Vipassana teacher still, um, and I did that store together, and he had a lot of jewelry and clothing items um, from Nepal that he bought, so he sold. And um, I had a couple of um, tankas that I thought at the time I didn't need. So I put them in the store. And then when uh, Geshe Gatsu 
came to Nevada City to visit our customers was very proud of the store, raising money for Dharma. And he walked in and he saw the Tonkas. And what do you think he did? Lost his shit. <laughs> so he was not right? You can't sell these. Um, so they came down. <laughs> so uh, this is another example of when we're when we're exchanging things from down point of view. It's a gift exchange. So even membership donations are gift exchanges. So fundraising is a gift exchange. So um, there's a movement of energy around the mandala that benefits everyone. So. Um, it's difficult though, because of course contractors and um, you know SMAD and PGE they have they have measurement right, so we have to be skillful. Sometimes we do have to say, um, yeah, it's going to cost X amount of money, and we have to raise X amount of money, but um, that's still uh, we have to spiritually keep it within the idea of a gift exchange, like that. So I try to stay in my inner child and think like someone's asked, you know, parents have asked, what do I want? And, you know, I don't know, I want the bicycle or I want the stereo or something. And, you know, do some research and you get it right. So, but it's still a gift, even though you do the research. So the people that have already given so much for Alliance or over the years, um, uh, you can tell that the gift does come back, haven't you? It comes back. It's interesting. Not like a transaction, but in a way of blessings and support. So the other part of right livelihood is the Buddha um, actually liked um, business people and um, merchants quite a bit. I think part of it was... Um, we had discussions with various Western scholars is that um, when when you bargain for things, you have to have this relationship. You have to kind of say, here's, I have uh, yak oil and you have some tea, you know? Like in Tibet, they used to go to China and, and in Tibet, they couldn't get the tea, but, and the Chinese didn't have the yak oil, so it's changing, right? And salt, things like this. So the fact that you have, um, you know, merchants or you have uh, that kind of uh, business interchange uh, helps promote business if it's honest business, correct? So here I would like to um, say that we're uh, able to support honest business, right, livelihood, and um, form at some point a group maybe informal to start with and later to have classes on how to do right livelihood and honest business. Um, it's it's really challenging. It's probably a lot up there with being married or something <laughs> because the, the market forces are really strong, right? So we need a lot of support. Um, I mentioned to a few people that I used to belong to uh, um, a uh, business consulting group in the banner called the Brian Patch. And um, that really helped me when I was, uh, you know, starting my magazine at the time. And the Brian Patch wasn't fun when we'd get to have dinner, but there were also business consultants and we'd party and have fun and uh, you'd meet really interesting people, which was different than just going to a uh, CPA or a bookkeeper or a business consultant, you find out how people actually do their business. Like, how, how, how did you actually get started? How did you work it up? What was your vision? What, what are your stressors? Business people generally don't like to talk about it, you know, because it's somewhat proprietary. I found as a therapist that people would rather talk about death and sex than how they make their money. So <laughs> That's private. What are you just talking about? about you? You listen a lot. Where would I want to know? So, when I say, you know, my money resources must be money, you know, are you in budget, out of budget? That's, that's private. Okay. Uh, so, we, uh, when we have trust in Dharma, then um, 
people can, uh, you know, share their business ideas. Like when, um, you know, way back when I had to declare bankruptcy many years ago, uh, you know, there were very few people you could talk to, right? Because, you know, no one, you're just talking to your attorney, as people know that I've gone bankrupt, <laughs> go to bankrupt attorney, and they say, okay, we'll get started. Now I need check for $4,000. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, but we, you know, we need a kind of a business circle that people are savvy with, um, with bookkeeping, with raising money, with loans, with finance, and, and we actually have a lot of that in the Sangha right now, but uh, we can, and we know how to do it, um, we can expand on that and, and help people a lot. Because when people are struggling financially or they don't know how to get their dream off the ground, um, a lot of times they're, they're not able to practice, right? So we, we actually like business people in Dharma, and the Buddha did too. It's, it's very interesting. It wasn't, um, you know, I'm I'm not a fan of like rather being uber uber rich folks necessarily. But um, the Buddha was very even like just nobody had any money, or he would hang out with princes and wealthy people too, right? He was very even. So uh, he he did accept gifts. Uh, Anathana Pindika uh, was a wealthy lay person who uh, wanted to buy a retreat or get retreat land or just a monastery land for the Buddha and uh, approached the local prince, Prince Jeta. And you know this story, right? It's documented. And But um, Prince Jeta said, to him, you know, my, my grove is not in a grove or a park, not enough for sale. So go away. So I uh, happened to get went away for a while and thought, and it came back. It's a longer story, but it came back and said, um, uh, "How about if uh, I cover the whole park with gold, gold coins?" And uh, Prince Jeta said, "Yeah, sure, right. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, right." Um, never believing, but uh, Anatha Pindika covered it with gold coins, right? So that became the Jeta girl. Uh, so with, without that vast wealth, you know, the, we, we might not be here today, right? So we've always appreciated in Dharma, um, the, uh, the Dharma Rajas, right? Um, and somewhere in this room, the Dharma Rajas would say, okay, I, I have this great benefit and you can share it. And um, it promotes um, the well-being of the world. So the Buddha um, did gracefully accept um Gifts from princes um, is, is very interesting. Um, uh, he would also accept lunch and gifts from uh, uh, famous courtesans, which is a very <laughs> euphemistically way of saying what, you know? Yeah, people criticize him for that. He, he, would, he would go, to, you know, there, there'd be these very, uh, famous uh, pleasure gardens and um, uh, the, the very powerful courtesans would, to use that term, would uh, uh, want to hear the Dharma. And uh, then uh, one very famous one invited him to lunch and he got a lot of you know, a little pushback, but he went to lunch. And that's interesting, isn't it? So uh, he would go out to have lunch with very wealthy people and also lunch with nobody. But most of all, he wanted to promote um, that, you know, what we think of as uh, the middle class in India, the merchant class, like that. So I feel that if we do a right livelihood program here and um, we let people know how we can do honest business, then I think it'll be a great benefit. And it could help our businesses too. I certainly have gotten all shut out a lot of very much help from from Megan, our bookkeeper. Isn't that so? People, you know, it's like so. <laughs> so uh, then very much help from uh, Guy Crouch, who's been our CPA for, for many years now. You can just call these people up and 
You even got emotional. <laughs> so you can't do that over really. So, you know, it's like not really not not over the top, but you know, I can call a guy and make him go, you know, I'm just freaking out over here. I have no idea what's happened to this money, what we do with that. Can you just fix it? I'm I'm going crazy. And we'll just kind of go, okay. <laughs> So, uh, same way with, um, you know, nice uh, attorneys, you know, that um, help us set up, um, you know, legal things that we can work with. Um, so, that's that's all in the right livelihood. So, it's, it's really joyful when people can do honest business and you can, uh, you know, get correct feedback, isn't it? And uh, I, didn't, I really don't like our bill very much. Uh, it's sold a couple of times now. It's like BMO. I don't know what that stands for, but I have these ideas in my head. But we really like our personal broker there, Chris Ford, right? So we can go down to the Lowman's Plaza, the local bank, and we just sit with Chris, and it's very peaceful, and he works it out. So that's that's uh, right lively too. Um, uh, some people know uh, when um, we bought the house in Orangeville for investment, uh, Irving Kronchik and the manager of the whole uh, Bank of the West in Northern California came. Do you remember that? Who was there? That's really incredible, right? You know, so that's right livelihood because then the, the folks at the bank who they were not blessed and I mean, it's very Catholic actually, you know, but they sound like, okay, we're, we're really doing things, you know, stand out, right? But, you know, here's, you know, here's how we do things and it's very stand up and here's what we want. And um, then uh, through Susan Frost contact, we, you know, have a very nice realtor, right? Super nice realtor. Um, so this is, you know, these are promoting values that um, come through to the greater community much more in some ways than if we said, well, you should meditate or you should be kind or, you know, I don't like to lecture people really. But when they see you're easy to work with and you're trying to have a good product and you're working with them, then um, an immense amount of trust starts, right? So the uh, uh, Dharma spread in many ways uh, through the merchants, right? Because they had to, they had to reach out and talk with people. Generally, a lot of times Buddhists, particularly Indian Buddhists, we're uh, we're not interested in spreading the Dharma. Do you do you like that? Yeah, <laughs> like um, a teacher did not really want to go to Tibet. I don't think Padma Sambhava wanted to really go to Tibet either. Like, you know, um, I don't know. I, I I guess there are some places I wouldn't want to visit. Um, I wouldn't want to visit a war zone, but um, you know, from the Indian point of view, the Tibetans were complete barbarians. That you know, so Tara had to you know come to Atisha a number of times and say, "Look, you know, you got to go." So, um, it, but it was the merchants uh, that traded. You see, and that went to China, went to Tibet. Because there was obviously uh, trading between Tibet and India, um, Tibet and China, India and China before uh, we had formal dharma. That makes sense, right? You know, relationships were established first. You know, silk. Everybody in Asia wanted silk from China, right? I mean, Christopher Columbus, what was Christopher Columbus looking for? Silk, right? So in Europe, you know, maybe uh, Queen Isabella, you know, said, look, um, I, I need silk underwear. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know she said Columbus. I, you know, it's like she got it. Like, okay, you want you know, to get the silk cord going? This is what we're all about. Get it, you know? Um, so that kind of exchange, um, the rice and the silk, or Tibet, the, the wool, very important. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I, I could go on and on about um, 
on this business and right livelihood. I do want to share one confession is that um, back in the day when I had my magazine, we needed to get financing and um, uh, I'd read um, Michael Phillips' book, uh, Honest Business. Michael Phillips was a man that was associated with the Bank of America that originated the, the first kind of credit card. So he said, <laughs> I made my pitch and um, I said, it's great. And uh, we ended up getting a grant from Glide Memorial Church. Anybody from San Francisco know where Glide was? Um, and uh, because the magazine was a cultural magazine and was kind of, it was something, you know, I thought, okay, that would be a good investment. Well, I think the most of my publications, they're, ex they're even worse than restaurants. So <laughs> we, we ended up going bankrupt. And um, I was felt like, how do we borrow like $50,000 from Glide? You know, Glide is, you know, kind of and giving money to, um, you know, nonprofits and other things like that. So once again, like, my guy's totally cool. I goes, well, this is a real sky you know, and uh, the board of Glide knew also, and we just wanted to support your idea. That was honest business too, right? There wasn't like, I'm going to come after you and, you know, like uh, pursue you and sue you. It's just like, okay. So that was, that was interesting, but I still feel bad about losing $50,000. That was a lot back in like, 1980 and stuff like that, don't you think? Mm. So maybe maybe I can stop here. I'd, I'd like to hear if anybody has um, some questions uh, about right livelihood or like what what am I doing with what what should we do with these? Mm. Maybe I need to say if, do I need to say a few things about them? Maybe not. So right in the center. Um, there are these like wool kind of glovey things that are actually socks with holes in them. Does anybody know what those could have possibly been used for? Just curious. Hmm? Yes, for doing frustrations. So, um, yeah, to do Mindra. People have expressed Mindra here. It kind of it kind of fluffs up and then goes back down. And I can understand why it's demanding, you know. So um, I had like a, a prostration board, um, a long, you know, kind of slick, and then you have kind of a pad at the end for your head. But um, to do a lot, you, you know, it, it's it's better to slide. So you, you have these wool gloves, you know, and it can slide. Um, I had bad knees to start with, and I, I, I totally ruined my knees doing a ninja prostration. <laughs> <laughs> but those are from doing, you know, 100,000 prostrations, so that's a big deal. And then uh, uh, I have a couple of uh, bell and scepter sets. So those, the bell and scepter are like the, um, the mark of a true tantrika. So you're supposed to have a balance after that. Um, and I've used all those over time. There's a really big one, which I've used outside occasionally at uh, Lotus View, because it, it's nice and big. Uh, you could bring in the, the cows with that, something. And, um, and then there are these little, um, uh, little statues. So uh, a tradition is the uh, Lonely Rimshu would be carrying around uh, these objects uh, uh, in their kind of sash or their belt um, pocket or something like that and doing a lot of practice over them. So I'm, I'm offering those to this um, there's a coin in and uh, different Buddhas there. What else? There's just bells up here, right? I don't know, there's a cover on, on the Bell and Dorji, right? I can't see. Oh, the yeah, so uh, 
the, the word mala then uh, has counters on it. So the counters are um, generally, obviously, to keep count. So uh, you do a round, um, which even if there's 108 beads, is usually counted as 100 because you probably screwed up at least eight. And then you, 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 you know, you pull up and pull down the counter. So they're 10. So you, you do a, a boom, sometimes it's called, and that's a, do a thousand like that. So um, people talk a lot about the model. I mean, this, if I was ever sitting around talking with um, my, my friends, you know, we're, we're generally talking about retreat stuff, you know, kind of moaning together. Because, like, um, uh, recently, Kenshin Moshe was here, an uh, old friend, and um, I was talking. <laughs> he did a, a, I think, a Mind Mangala Kala Chakra retreat at one point with, not too long ago, with um, John Moshe. And there was just like a month, you know, and uh, you know, given getting all the mantra recitations done, you know, just going, oh, and, you know, kind of like, dang, you know, can I get it done? Um, so those actually take time, right? Meditative organizations are a little different, but, um, you know, like a couple of years ago, I, you know, like Gishla, uh, um, Gishi Damshala, um, of course, he doesn't talk about his practice of really being very American by even saying anything, but like, so he's, he's doing a Hanagula um, uh, retreat, which also they all have tons of mantras. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you don't get done, in the, you know, so you don't get done a lot of time. So you have to go back to your teacher and negotiate for more time. You know, it's kind of humbling, like, because they go, <laughs> look at you, because it's happened to me. Well, what was the problem? I mean, you know, it's just, you know, it's, you have to do a hundred thousand of these long mantras, you know, it's a long, it takes a long time. And retreats take um, uh, a lot of uh, confidence and, um, uh, you know, time. So one of the biggest and most important things about us is we know as a lineage how to do long solar retreats. This, this is kind of like, you know, we do this and we do shorter retreats, but at some point somebody says, you know, I've got to fulfill my commitment to do Kala Chakra retreat or Vajragini or Yamantaka, something like that. And you have to sequester yourself, right? Um, and yeah, it's not just like, well, I'm going to meditate, see if something happens. You have to do, you have to, it's performative, right? You have to do it. So um, I'm hoping uh, when uh, I get established up in um, our Townsend that um, people that are at that level can come and do retreats, right? Because then we'll stick you in the, um, the uh, I call it the yoga yurt. But uh Kesha doesn't like the word yurt, just so you know. So it should be gear. Not like Richard Gare, but kind of gear. Um, and uh, we're going to put a, a gear on the land, and then people can come and do a retreat. But it, it's difficult. You have to be really confident. If you just, you know, it's the first couple of days you go, this is great, I'm on retreat, I'm great. Um, but even after a week, you start thinking, you mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, maybe I've got the realizations I need, you know. Maybe, maybe, it's not, you know some people are just a week, you know. So, um, but uh, to be able to do a long retreat um, with uh, your teacher or a qualified teacher next to you is extremely important. And this is where a lot of um, people struggle um, because they're at the practice and they're at the motivation to do the long retreats, but they don't have availability and they don't have sponsors. So one reason to have, uh, you know, sponsors and people that have done right livelihood and uh, 
been successful financially is then you have the merit of um, sponsoring, you know, someone on retreat, which is really a great benefit. So, um, my friend, uh, Lama Gosan, who I'd love to have you always always traveling or meditating, you know, so I helped sponsor him for his retreat, his three year retreat. Um, and for real, this is a long time, you know, to, uh, you know, it's like, when you first did it, honestly. So I go, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll sponsor you. Yeah, we're going to send you a couple hundred dollars. That sounds kind of like, that sounds doable, wasn't it? But, you know, it's about like, you're into two years, right? I mean, you know, so you have to think, I had to think, you know, right now how to do it, you know, you have to go, wait a minute. You know, because after you know, you, can, you start thinking other things you can do with a couple hundred dollars, particularly when you're kind of broke and you know, you know what was the figure, you know, like two hundred dollars every month for three years. What does that add up to? It was Megan when I need her, you know. So you start thinking, oh my cars but it is incredibly hard to be able to do that that the people that sponsor uh, people on uh, retreats you know should uh, have um you know the financial means so so that when you're giving you don't feel depleted right because then that's like negative merit and you don't want that you know so it was feel like yeah oh, that's fantastic they're doing great but so i i do want to at least I uh, have, um, you know, we have this incredible land with incredible view, and Jadaram Shea will come and bless it next time he's up. But to do to do a long retreat, like a month retreat or two months, to do the mantra commitments is really a big deal. I'm warning you, you know, because after a while you start thinking, I don't know, maybe, maybe my teacher kind of wrong, maybe, maybe I should be doing kind of a, a rafting trip. <laughs> I do an art class. Well, this, is the, this goes through our heads, right? So, so I think I, I covered everything here. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, these are generously donated. So um, Peter went out and got some framings. And um, so I'd like people to make a gift. And you can talk to Dan on how to do that. And uh, you know, take them, take them home. Um, really fantastic. You know, it's it's nice having. Um, uh, I, I like these the cloth tapestry uh, tonkas. Um, uh, this, uh, of course, someone painted, and there's an applique tonka vajrapani. But um, the the cloth ones have a lot of depth, and they're just kind of interesting. So, uh, from my side, you know, look like this uh, manjushri, like with. Um, uh, gold and uh, you know, it's just luminescent, don't you think? So people can say, I, you know, you you can say, okay, I want to make a uh, contribution, that and the contribution will go toward um, HVAC and maybe a little bit toward uh, retreats. Um, but then you could say, well, I want to keep it here, at Lions or you know, that's possible too. You know, we could say keep it at Lions or. But uh, I don't like sacred art to just be rolled up in that scene, right? So I do want people to to have it. So you know, maybe maybe we can uh, leave this up for a little while or something. People can. It sounds funny that I kind of do it this way, but that's American style. I want to be like open. 
so that we can't sell them, but we can gift them, and then you can gift lines or who's that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you'll. Yeah, maybe maybe we can you know uh, have a little discussion and close, and then people can do that. Mm. Yeah, that comes under announcements. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's good. Um, who, who, who's responsible for announcements? Patty? <laughs> you want to make an announcement about Answer Moshe? You better stand on. So, um, is this on? Yes, yeah, so, so, Congressman. I want to stand up. Okay. So Congressman Rinpoche will be here on Friday at 6.30 to give a public talk on, on, on his book. And there'll be books available. I, I don't have the title of this book in mind right now. Maybe, uh, do you know the exact title of it? Uh, um, a Monk's Something Happiness and Joy. Yeah, he was inspired um, to write this book to help others. And uh, so he's going all throughout California and maybe throughout the United States too. Um, these will be signed copies that you can uh, listen to him talk about his book and then receive a copy yeah. of your own. Yeah. And um, anyway, and, and then online, if you go to our website or uh, Lions Road uh, Dharma Center, then you can pre-order a book if you like. So, um, so that's my announcement. Kaksurupache. His book is. Um... And then final presentation of the mind training, the low jump trainings, um, with lots of his storytelling. He likes telling kind of stories, like Aesop fable kind of stories and Dharma stories. So um, initially, when I was reading, I thought, well, it's a little lightweight. But then, um, you know, kind of started sinking in a little bit more. And I, I see it as a good book for um, to give to people um who don't want to have you know Buddhism jammed down their throats because he talks of scientific things and psychological things and it's lighthearted. So I I'm I think it'll be fun and he's willing to sign it when you're here. So he's kind of playful like that. Um yes. Well I'm I'm making a request. I've made it actually but I'm not sure if it'll happen. But um on uh Friday before his talk I requested through his secretary, through his United States secretary, if he would give darshans. But I haven't heard yet, but once I do, I'll make an announcement so everybody who would like to see the, him would have that opportunity. Thank you. Kansu Roshi is currently the vice abbot of Guto Monastery um, in Damsala, huge. So, um, at some point, he'll uh, he'll be abbot, um, and that's when I say, "Oh, I'm very sorry for you." <laughs> but I actually I think he'll be pretty good. Um, so he has that responsibility, and and then he has his own monastery in Nepal, mostly for like kids. That's cool. Yeah, I'm got my bed and breakfast here, right on D Street, and um. Uh, the bed and breakfast is not cheap, but um, I think worth it. So we're going to do it. Yay. So you could probably visit in there. What do you think? So we should, um, does anybody else have a comment or a complaint? Because we can end, and then you can come and go, oh, okay, I want, I want one of these tonkas, or I you know, want to make a donation for um, the malas or the bells, and you, you decide, right? You decide what you can give. That makes sense. Just free. Makes sense. Mm.
I don't I don't know. Jen knows. Probably not. <laughs> this is right. Uh, yeah, you can you can bargain while I'm gone. You can do the education when I'm just right. Yeah, I'll stop now. So we're closing prayers and you still a little bit and educate people how to do it so that you guys learn how to do uh, among yourselves, how to do honest business and data, you know, because this is what the board and, and administration were just talking about. How are we, how we going to do this? How are we going to keep loving each other and give money and ask people to do things and keep loving each other and, you know, keep the lights on and have fun and take care of ourselves and take care of others and how to keep loving each other and like that. That's not the thing right now. So I'll let you do it. And then I can be thinking about, you know, like coffee with Mike on Mondays. And we discussed the the whole the whole history of Sacramento is the topic, isn't it? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so you know as as I go forward, if uh if you want to know my whole journey in Sacramento, uh, Mike Mike is the person to talk to. But I also know that Mike knows how to keep some secrets. Who <laughs> 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 Okay, let's do dedication. Okay, dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of the cheetah that has not arisen rise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by stone mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezing teams in Piazzo, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display, the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Have a look at Ishvara, great treasure of Bhagavad compassion, Manjushri, master of a flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of an entire host of Mars, Sankhapa, crown jewel of the Swedish sages, Lord Sandrapa, I make requests to your holy feet. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So I'm, I'm going to walk out and then you can ask Daniel and Jen and how, how the system works, right? We've put a lot of thought into it, actually. Omo araya pazaya na aindi Om araya pazaya na aindi